is the chief historian for the Office of the Secretary of State. He retired as editor and publisher of the Daily World in Aberdeen in 2008 after a 42 year career in journalism that saw him win awards for reporting, photography, historical features, editorials, and columns. Uh, he's an alumnus of the University of Puget Sound and the University of Maryland. He is a trustee of the Washington State Historical Society and the author of 11 books on Northwest history. In my Zoom in, invite, um, maybe you saw, I created a little KCLS book list that you can click on and that'll take you into KCLS's catalog that includes many of John's books as well as some of his colleagues that are part of the Legacy Washington um, portfolio, books that you can purchase on uh, notable Washington people. And uh, we'll also provide a link to uh, Legacy Washington's bookstore where you can purchase these as well. And with no further ado, I'm going to turn this over to John. John, welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for inviting us, Vicki. Um, I want to say in advance that I know many of you wanted to be home tonight watching reruns of the presidential debate. <laughs> So I'm gonna interrupt myself 73 times in the first two minutes to sort of set the tone. Also wanna apologize that there, the, uh, our friends in California who are dealing with tragic fires, the uh, smoke has reached Grace Harbor where I am tonight and the sun today looked like a, a giant scoop of orange sherbet on the, in the sky and so my throat's a little raw. So uh, if you'll uh, pardon me sniffing now and then, I'll, I'll power through. This book, uh, Ahead of the Curve, is really close to my heart because my, my five foot two inch grandmother in Oklahoma was a suffragist. Um, her brother uh, was, uh, maintained that the suffragists only wanted to pass equal right, equal voting rights for women so that they could ban liquor, which of course was the truth. And she um, put her tongue in her cheek and assured him that although she was a card carrying member of the, uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, that they would, they were, that was not on their agenda. Uh, it's really great to be at Mercer Island too, because I spent several days when I was researching my biography of Governor Spellman at the Mercer Island Library. Many of you know that he grew up at Hunts Point and he had a front row seat for that debate over the first Mercer Island floating bridge. Uh, so I, I had a, a lot of interest in the librarians at Mercer Island were wonderful. There's some important historic documents there. And as a former uh, Timberland Le Regional Library trustee, I am one who gets to work at the Washington State Library, which is an absolute treasure. Um, it's always a pleasure to be at a library. Well, the, the reason this book is so close to my heart is because it's, um, I think it ought to be required reading in every Washington State um, history class in middle school and high school, because these women that we found, 21 and all, are absolutely extraordinary. And I'll get into that quickly here. It used to break my heart when my two daughters came home from their um, mandatory Washington State history class and said that Washington State history was boring because nothing could be further from the truth. And, and I think we've got past the day when the Washington State history classes were taught by former uh, volleyball coaches who had little interest in that, with all due respect to former volleyball coaches. But uh, having written widely about Washington State history for the past 40 years, this collection of remarkable women is, is just absolutely amazing. Uh, a study conducted by the National Women's History Museum last year concluded Included that women, notable women, were dramatically unrepresented in, in K through 12 curricula. It was about one woman for every three men. And in Washington State, um, we set out with this book um, through Legacy Washington uh, to observe the 2020 centennial of women's suffrage by spotlighting these remarkable women. Uh, a few words in the beginning about who we are and what we do. The Legacy Project is a program of the Office of the Secretary of State. It started out as um, in 2008 when I joined the program because the old program had conducted only oral histories of former legislators. And former Secretary of State Sam Reed and State Senator Sam Hunt agreed that what we needed to do was to branch out, separate the programs and the uh, 
The Secretary of State's office now does oral histories and long form books, biographies, curricula, exhibits, spotlighting um, first former members of Congress, former statewide elected officials, former members of the judiciary, and then the two Sams wrote a really wonderful codicil in there that said, and other citizens from all walks of life who've made an indelible contribution to the political history of the state. So that gave us um, entree to do, to find a 95 year old civil rights worker in Bremerton that hardly anybody knew about outside of Kitsap County, who'd actually been in the trenches in the 1940s when thousands of uh, African Americans from the South and industrialized North arrived in, uh, in Washington State to work in at the Bremerton shipyards, the Boeing plants, um, and do that kind of work. And uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of the uh, people who came were also unreconstructed old segregationists. So what um, Lillian Walker, the subject of one of the books we did, the civil rights leader did, was confront racism head on. Um, she and her husband um, ended up writing uh, a law, which was one of the first passed in the late 1940s to advance equal accommodations to ban redlining. It was just a remarkable story. Uh, I see a picture here too. Well, here's an array of some of the books we've done in the past 12 years. Um, former Governor Booth Governor, Booth Gardner rather, um, Billy Frank of the uh, Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, former Senator Slade Gorton, whom we lost just the other day at the age of 92. Nancy Evans, an extraordinary first lady, who among other things saved the governor's mansion from demolition and, and replacement by a pretty uh, pedestrian looking rambler. Jennifer Dunn, whom I know many of you remember well as your congresswoman on the east side. And then a collection of, of books um, that dealt with World War II veterans, Korean War veterans, um, 1968, the year that, that changed the world. Um, what a cataclysm of events there, the assassinations of, of Martin Luther King Jr., Bobby Kennedy, the, the, the turmoil over the 1968 Democratic National Convention. Uh, it was, it, we interviewed, um, one of the things about here that I want to talk about if we have time is how we all need to be oral historians. When I give these talks, I run into people who talk to me afterwards and say, gosh, I wish I had recorded my mom or my aunt Madge or my uncle Bill because they had so many stories to tell. And, and it's, it's easier than ever now with uh, high quality digital tape recorders available for well under $100 that do broadcast quality recordings. And they're just priceless. All of the interests we have today in 23andMe and Ancestry.com, these, these stories are, are just amazing. Um, I see also, I guess I should segue right away because I see here, I see the redoubtable Judge Carolyn Dimmick, who in 1982 became the first female member of the Washington Supreme Court. And the, the sexism that, and chauvinism that had preceded Carolyn Dimmick's rise to the high court is pretty remarkable. In 1953, when she passed the bar exam, the Seattle PI had a headline that said, um, pretty blonde water skier passes bar. Um, and then in, when she joined the court, uh, her old boss, King County prosecutor, introduced her as the prettiest, the prettiest justice on the court. So if you fast forward today, we have in Washington State the most remarkably diverse court in the United States. The, uh, the seven two majority that we have on the Washington Supreme Court today is pretty extraordinary. Seven two female. Uh, and then the diversity that's on there, two members who uh, uh, openly identify with the LGBT community, uh, the first ever Native American uh, Superior Court Justice, Hispanic Superior Court Justice. Uh, the Native American Justice, by the way, is part Pueblo and of Jewish extraction. And it, it, when I talked to, uh, to Justice Dimmick, who's now on the federal bench not long ago, she just shook her head and marveled. Well, let me get into um, the grits 
of this remarkable story of ahead of the curve. The, um, the women of Washington have always been ahead of the curve. And along the way, we ought to say some kind words for some of the men who helped them get there. Uh, in the 1900s, some of them even called themselves suffragettes and marched with banners alongside the women. Um, uh, for their trouble, uh, many were ridiculed and some tomatoes were thrown. But um, in 1910, when the women of Washington finally won the vote permanently, fully 64% of the electorate, the all-male electorate, vote my male, that would be M-A-L-E, vote by male electorate um, approved equal suffrage for women and it passed in all 39 counties. How we got there is another story. In, 19, in 1854 at the first meeting of the Territorial Assembly, um, Seattle pioneer Arthur Denny was the one who introduced a resolution uh, saying that women deserved the vote. It failed by one vote. Um, by the way, Arthur Denny, speaking of righteous guys, he absolutely abhorred liquor and he respected women. And he, um, he, he in fact urged that all white females over the age, eight, over the age of 18 be allowed to vote. And for the, it would take another 56 years for that to come to fruition. And along the way, there were fits and starts. There were votes where um, women were ridiculed as she males and uh, home wreckers and the, um, the failed twice at the ballot box. The Washington Supreme Court and the Territorial Supreme Court did all sorts of uh, judicial jujitsu to keep women from winning the vote. At one time, they even uh, drew in a carrot and uh, an insert symbol and put uh, inserted all male voters into the state constitution to authenticate what they were doing by disenfranchising women. So it was a really a real ro roller coaster ride. The next person we ought to meet uh, is a book within a book and ahead of the curve. And her name was Josephine Corliss Preston. I was introduced to Josephine Corliss Preston and what a remarkable woman she was because Secretary of State Wyman, when I was in her office one day, I noticed next to her photo, frame photo on the wall and her election certification, there was a photo of jo 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 Josephine Corliss Preston. And I said, hmm, this is interesting. Why is she there? And she said, because she was the first ever statewide female elected official and the first and moreover Republican, and it took 100 years for the next female Republican to be elected. So there was a, a real kinship there. Josephine, well, mainly she was Republican because there weren't many Democrats in Washington State in 1912, at least who had uh, much moxie. And she, her story is just remarkable. She was... Um, had been a 16-year-old school teacher on the, on the plains of Minnesota before she came to uh, Walla Walla, Dayton, and um, had a short life marriage, and uh, that I think we can read between the lines, fell apart because Josephine was so insistent about continuing her career as a teacher and, and wanting to move up. And so she became the first ever female superintendent of schools in Walla Walla County at a time when women could not vote for themselves. And when women won the vote in 1910, um, there's a fascinating story, by the way, about that. The Wyoming was an early adopter, one of the first, uh, in fact, to uh, grant female suffrage. And I, when I was studying for this presentation, I found out for the first time, and I wished I had it in the book, that one of the reasons is that there were, there were 6,000 men in Wyoming and only 1,000 women. And they thought that if they, uh, if they staked out a, a claim as a progressive state, like the Mercer girl, they could re attract more women in five brides. So, so much for Wyoming. The, um, in 1910, when Josephine Corliss Preston really got active in the suffrage movement after having, hearing the redoubtable Emma Smith DeVoe get a, a speech at uh, Whitman College, um, she leapt into it feet first and, um, and just became so passionate about equal rights. The, w what was fascinating to me was that the women's club movement 
had played such a key role in, in advancing equal rights. And it, uh, along the way, it also attracted women of all different political persuasions, socialist women, conservative women, liberal women, gay women who were pretty much closeted. Um, and it coalesced in 1912 with uh, Josephine's candidacy for, for state superintendent of public instruction, there were no less than three women on the vote on the ballot, including a socialist, a firebrand socialist like Helen Gurley Flynn. And, uh, and the speech making was really pretty remarkable. And also that year, we had the remarkable uh, confluence of Theodore Roosevelt seeking a third term to the presidency as a progressive on the bull moose ticket. Uh, William Howard Taft, the incumbent Republican, and Woodrow Wilson, the um, the intellectual former Princeton University president involved. And the outcome, of course, was that um, they were jockeying for position in the women's votes or not. Taft, um, it was sort of tone deaf on that and uh, gave some speeches that, that were half-hearted at best about suffrage. Uh, Wilson was a latecomer to the notion, but then he got on board. But Teddy Roosevelt was in there with all of his bull moose vigor, uh, wooing the women's vote. And there, and for that, there were cartoons that were done that showed Roosevelt uh, dancing around a maypole with uh, suffragists in their their sashes and their bonnets, and it was pretty amazing stuff. Well, Josephine Corliss Preston was elected superintendent of public instruction. And they, they had no real idea, I think, even the Republicans and the kind of reformer they were gonna get because she hit Olympia like a whirlwind. Um, and she advocated a whole wealth of, of reforms. For example, the, 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 uh, the notion that, that women, teachers, should actually be paid much as men. They were the, they were by far and away the majority of teachers in the public school system, but they were still being disenfranchised yet again, discriminated against by not earning as much as the men on the as the notion that the men, most of whom had families, needed that that extra income, and she wasn't putting up with that. Um, she advanced the notion of of kindergartens of community colleges, of reform for the teacher's retirement system. Uh, it, it was absolutely remarkable. And she, uh, in her third term, she ran headlong into a troglodyte governor named Roland Hartley from Everett, who maintained that, they should, that, that there shouldn't even be public financing for uh, public schools taxpayer financing that, that we were coddling the youth of, of the state and that, that in kindergartens in particular to him were, were just uh, anathema. So jo Josephine won that battle um, and she, she ran into a lot of trouble from the men on, our, on her staff and she tried to be uh, uh, diverse in her, in her staff, such as it was about six or seven at the time. And they resented her and portrayed her often as being headstrong and willful and all those things that supposedly aren't uh, uh, strong women. Um, we value those 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 attributes in in, in women uh, in men rather, but women they were seen as unseemly. So that's what she had to deal with. And after. Um, Four terms, they finally bumped her off in the middle of a, of a, a, a financial crisis for the state, but she was the gold standard. Uh, what she accomplished the, along the way, soon after she became superintendent of public instruction, she was elected president of the National Education Association, which then included superintendents and principals and became an absolute nationwide force for um, for better education. When she left office, after they finally, the men finagled to get her out of office, the United States Department of Education said that Washington had the most progressive, finest schools in the nation. So there's a book within a book. She's ahead of the curve and uh, will always be there. And I, it's just such a treat to uh, educate 
with this book and with talks like this, a whole generation of people who had no idea who she was. And I hope we can change that. The, the other suffragist who's just absolutely inimitable is a physician named Mabel Seagrave. And Mabel Seagrave uh, was uh, a Seattle girl. Who, her father was a, a hotel owner. She uh, excelled in math and the science in the sciences, and in uh, matriculated to Wellesley College, an elite East Coast girls school, women's school. Um, got there on sheer merit, not any certainly any family connections. Although one of her dear friends was the granddaughter of the aforementioned. Uh, uh, state uh, representative who had introduced the uh, the equal suffrage view uh, bill in 1854 for florence helliker florence denny helliker uh, together at wellesley college they they were um, amazing progressives uh, teddy roosevelt all the way and in 1911 uh, on again on pure merit uh, Dr. Seagrave or uh, Seagrave, Mabel Seagrave was admitted to the Johns Hopkins Medical School. And Johns Hopkins was a, a progressive medical school in its day for admitting women. She graduated in 1911 as one of seven graduates. And with the outbreak of World War uh, I, uh, she had been such an active suffragist that the National Women's Suffrage Association sent her and her classmate Florence Denny Helliker to the front lines in France. Dr. Seagrave is a surgeon in Florence Denny, uh, who had become a club woman in Seattle and society lady, uh, also well known for philanthropic work, work among uh, uh, impoverished children. Uh, Florence took a, a, a crash course in, in rudimentary x-ray work and uh, off they were to France. Well, when they got to France, it was pretty amazing. The French, for one, appreciated the lady doctor from Seattle who was remarkably intrepid and organized village people to, to help treat the wounded and to treat the thousands of refugees who were caught up in the war as well. Come um, late in 1918, there was the eruption of the so-called Spanish flu. And if ever there was a, a libel against the Spanish, it was the Spanish flu because the flu didn't originate in Spain. It originated on the East Coast of the United States and we imported it to, to France and Europe. But the, uh, one of the things that we've forgotten in the middle of this horrendous, horrendous pandemic that we're enduring is that the Spanish flu was decimated people around the world. The estimate is that at least 50 million people died, and a lot of experts think it was twice that, 100 million. So after the armistice, uh, Dr. Seagrave stayed on to treat victims of the Spanish flu at great peril to her own, her own health. Um, the, uh, by the way, uh, I find it fascinating that President Trump's grandfather, 49-year-old Friedrich Trump, died of the Spanish flu between 1918 and I think it was in 1919. There were 675,000 deaths in the United States between 1918 and 1919 from the Spanish flu and Friedrich Trump was one of those. President Trump uh, didn't know that until recently, he said. And uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was then a vibrant pre-polio young assistant secretary of the Navy, uh, visited the battlefields of France, desperately wanted to, to be in, in service like his cousin Theodore, but uh, had to settle for touring the battlefields, caught the flu and nearly died on the way home. When Eleanor and, and uh, Mrs. Roosevelt met FDR at the dock, he was uh, near death. So the, it's an amazing story about uh, what um, Mabel Seagrave did. And not only that, but she was an absolute hoot. But she, the the annals of the Women's University Club at Seattle, where she was a charter member, are replete with with Dr. Seagrave's impersonations of Teddy Roosevelt, Benito Mussolini, and Mae West. And anyone who can run the the gamut from Teddy Roosevelt to Mae West in one stunt evening show, a theatrical is okay by me. She was just 
uh, in inimitable voice for women's suffrage in Washington state. She went on, by the way, to become the first Seattle female chief of staff at Seattle General Hospital and was a founding uh, a founding member of what was what became Children's Orthopedic Hospital. Uh, we pair, by the way, these remarkable women in this book with modern day counterparts. And one of the best profiles in this book was written by my colleague, Bob Young, who was a member of two Pulitzer Prize winning staffs at the Seattle Times as an investigative reporter and has brought to our program just the remarkable attributes of, attributes of being a digger and a fine writer. He wrote about Mary Claire King. Um, Mary Claire King is one part Sherlock Holmes and one part Einstein and in all, she, she, after 17 years of painstaking research, this University of Washington genetics professor discovered the single gene that predisposes women to breast cancer and received a national um, medal from President Obama, justifiably for that work. It's just uh, an absolute breakthrough. Bob's piece is as good as anything you'll read in the New Yorker. It's just ripples with the, the detective mystery of Mary Claire um, chasing down all these loose ends and, and finally pinpointing this gene. Um, the, uh, I could, when I talked about Carolyn Dimmick and the Washington State Supreme Court, I need to fast forward to, to the person Carolyn Dimmick was paired with, and that is former Chief Justice Mary Fairhurst. Justice Fairhurst, who has been uh, to known to many of us for her absolutely courageous battle fighting cancer, uh, was, the, was the person who, after a cliffhanger election in 2002, created this first female majority on the Washington Supreme Court. And she became, uh, a rem with her, um, her Jesuit background, her dad was, uh, uh, played a key role at Gonzaga University, her alma mater, and the alma mater of several other justices on the court, notably Chief Justice Deborah Stevens. Um, she brought to the court this remarkable civility and consensus building. And her, when she, when she ascended to the court and created this first female majority, the several of the women I interviewed on the court, including former Chief Justice Barbara and Madsen, told me what a difference Mary had made and that what the arrival of a female majority meant to that court. Justice Madsen talked about um, it not ruefully, but with a, a sense of um, of how things have changed with how, how hard it was for her to really have her voice be heard. She told me that there were times when she would make an argument in chambers and, um, and look around the table and see that people seem to be nodding. But 20 minutes later, a male colleague would make the same argument and echo, echo what she'd said and that all this is what passed for a revelation. So um, <clears throat> these, uh, from the pretty blonde water skier days to the, the arrival of Mary Fairhurst and uh, it's just a, a sea change in what, what we've seen on the court. The, um, I wanted to talk to you about some of these other remarkable people. One of those is Elsie Parrish. Elsie Parrish was a hotel chambermaid in Walla Walla who had the temerity to ask to be paid the minimum wage. Uh, when she was not paid the minimum wage by her employer, she sought out an attorney, a small town attorney, and they ended up taking their case all the way to the United States Supreme Court, where in 1937, they prevailed. And as Bob says in his profile of Elsie, uh, who's just a good working class lady who had the gumption to demand what she was what she was owed by her employer. It also uh, coincided with upholding several other New Deal programs that were the uh, the absolutely absolute linchpin of Roosevelt's uh, New Deal programs. So. Uh, Bob found along the way, uh, speaking of uh, 
uh, coincidences and, and what we find out through Ancestry.com that a former Oregon governor um, discovered that Elsie was a, a relative of hers. And so that was, that was really a lot of fun. The, um, another profile that's in here and someone I had always wanted to meet is Stephanie Kuntz. And Stephanie Kuntz uh, went from being a radical anti-war uh, protester at the University of Washington to one of the most esteemed uh, sociologists in American history. She wrote a book called The Way We Never Were. Well, she was on the faculty at the Evergreen State College. In that book, The Way We Never Were, which uh, deflated the myths uh, about uh, how, how great things were in the halcyon 1950s, I guess that was when America was really great, the, uh, the, it all really wasn't that well at the Ozzie and Harriet house. Um, uh, Ricky was dabbling in drugs. Uh, and uh, Lucy and Ricky, uh, you couldn't even say that Lucy was pregnant on the I Love Lucy because that would offend people's sensibilities when she was great with trial with little Ricky. Well, Jose, uh, Stephanie uh, skewered all that. And uh, when the United States Supreme Court handed down its landmark ruling on same-sex marriage, the court's 5-4 opinions cited uh, Stephanie Kuntz twice in her research, uh, just after Confucius and Cicero, by the way. So I would really urge you to read The Way We Never Were, because one of the whole traits of getting to know this book is getting to, to have dinner with Stephanie Kuntz when she had our whole staff over to the house and find out uh, what a remarkable sociologist and teacher she is. It, it uh, I would have thought it was I died died and gone to heaven if I could have had a professor as unstuffy and and riveting a, a, a speaker as Stephanie. For me, um, one of my first um, beats as a young reporter at the Aberdeen Day of the World in 1966 was covering the Kunal Indian Nation when it was asserting for the first time its treaty rights and rights to self-determination. Um, Fast forward to my time as a covering the Bolt decision on Indian fee, uh, treaty fishing rights. And then one of the people I met in the 1980s was a brilliant young girl, teenage girl named Fawn Sharp, who grew up to be the president of the Kunal Indian Nation. And in 2019, at the age of 49, the president of the National Con Congress of American Indians. And her story in this book is, is, is pretty wonderful. Um, she has resolved, um, her tribe, by the way, uh, at the ancestral village of Tahola is um, barely at sea level. So given what we know now about uh, tectronic plates and the necessity to, to be prepared for the big one if and when it comes, which it surely must, um, where the tribe is busy trying to move the ancestral village to higher ground to, um, to exercise self-determination and hold big oil accountable for uh, in the, uh, what we're seeing it's in climate change. And Fawn is right in the middle of all that. Uh, we should really watch her career because I would not be surprised to see her as uh, a future United States Senator or Supreme Court Justice in her own right. She graduated from Gonzaga at the age of 19, went on to the University of Washington to earn a law degree, and is um, a remarkable representative of all that's happening in uh, among indigenous peoples to assert their rights um, for equity and justice for this land was their land long before ours. We need to remember that. Who else do we have here? Wow, what a remarkable thing. We've got a woman I interviewed named Linnea Laird. And Linnea Laird became the first ever female chief engineer for the Washington State Department of Highways. She's a, a small, soft-spoken, but dynamic woman who just through sheer competence in engineering brilliance made her way 
in the Washington State Department of Transportation when a whole series of bright women were moving up. Paula Hammond, the Secretary of Transportation, um, encouraged, by the way, by some, some really encouraging male mentors. Um, and Linnea, Linnea became um, the first ever female uh, chief engineer. Uh, when I designed the, to be head of design and engineering for the new Tacoma Narrows Bridge, and when she retired uh, early, um, she was hired uh, by the city of Seattle to take over the Alaska Way Viaduct project and the Highway 99 tunnel project. And people in Seattle marveled that when Lin Linnea arrived, people who had been at cross purposes actually started talking to one another uh, collaborating and making sense. And I found her to be um, absolutely one of the most refreshing role models. Be, first, she was so self-effacing, say, gee, why are you writing about me? Well, gee, because you're pretty amazing. Uh, we, in pairing these educators, by the way, Josephine Corliss Preston, her opposite number in the 21st century, is the absolutely remarkable Anna Mari Kause, the president, the first female president of the University of Washington. And Anna Mari's story is a, it reads like um, reads like fiction. Her parents were Cuban exiles from Castro's Cuba. Uh, arrived here, uh, if I recall correctly, her dad was working at manual labor. They made their work here, a shoe factory, I believe. Um, her, her father having been minister of education in Cuba, and now he's working in Florida in a shoe factory. Um, it, but Anna Marie never really felt deprived. It was because um, her family was so close-knit, valued education as such a, a high calling, and tragedies pockmarked her, 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 youth. Her brother, an activist, was murdered by the Ku Klux Klan. She ar arrived at the University of Washington at a, at a, a very uh, uh, cataclysmic time for student rights and the like. Uh, she was held by the student newspaper and other factions to be uh, not sufficiently qualified or minority enough to, to head a department. Um, in her, the way she dispelled the naysayers is, tells you so much about her character and her intellect. Uh, I have not yet met her, but, I, but when you read the story, you will meet her. Bob just brings her right off the page into your, into your heart. Uh, it's, it's truly remarkable. The, um, my longtime friend, Christine Gregoire, your former two-term governor, uh, attorney general, Department of College director, um, is in deservedly in this book for her, her role as a first female deputy attorney general in jawboning the so-called comparable worth settlement. Uh, and what a long, strange trip that was to the idea that the value work by plumbers and librarians could be considered compared and that some jobs were determined to have similar value to an employer, the pay should be equal. It's just a thicket of, of legalese and, um, and she navigated it. And after being on one side, uh, brought the settlement to fruition and created for uh, women in, in government, um, the long overdue, some of the long overdue equity that Josephine Corliss Preston had fought for. So, uh, I, although I'm the co-author of this book, let me tell you, you really need to read it, and young people really need to read it, because there are 21 role models in there. The exhibit at the State Library, um, which unfortunately due to the coronavirus, we're unable to have uh, people come and see the exhibit in, per in person. It's, it's really remarkable, done by our colleague Amber Rainey. It jumps off the wall, but for in the meantime, it's going to have to jump off your screens. Or if you have to be a teacher, you can go to our site, download each of the exhibit panels as a poster for your classroom, um, 
or for your own uh, enjoyment, and you will see how we've paired these people and, and how, how it, it, it's just vibrant. It really works. Um, we, we've worked too with the Office of the Superintendent of Public Construction to develop curriculum that augments um, this exhibit. The, um, all of this stuff's online for free. When we publish a printed book, we do it, Laura Mott, uh, my colleague, does it through fundraising, through a legacy trust. Uh, we do not take taxpayers' money for the printed books, but they're all free and online, the entire book, the entire exhibit. So in a way, we're sort of shooting ourselves in the foot. We never thought that we'd sell a lot of books, but we wanted to have it, to have people uh, enjoy it two ways. So I'm one of those who wants a printed book, the tactile sensation of having a book in my hands, but uh, I, I'm, I'm glad too that they're all free. Um, the, one of the things we need to talk about is that the talking book program was toppled by the Office of the Secretary of State, which brings these, these books to, to folks um, with disabilities. And, and what, a, what a treat that is when someone with a, a, a sight disability tells me how much they enjoyed a, uh, one of our books. I, so it's 746, and I'd like to talk to you about um, a labor of love. In 1966, rather, I'll start earlier than that. In 1961, when I was 17 years old and a freshman at Grace Harbor College in Aberdeen, I met a newly elected congresswoman from Washington named Julia Butler Hansen. And if you, many of you may have heard of her, I hope, because it she is the daughter of the daughter and granddaughter of suffragists. And if ever the word tour de force, which is overworked, has real currency, it fits Julia. Famously, she could cuss like a logger. She had to make her way in a man's world in, in the Washington legislature in the 1930s, in 1940s. And uh, legend has it that a man who insulted her uh, after she, her first speech as a freshman legislator in 1939 dismissed her speech as being that her matter, her her thoughts didn't really matter because she was, after all, only a woman. The the afterward that she uh, encountered him on the at the outside the courthouse in tiny Wakayakum County and decked him. Uh, I was never able to fully uh, fully authenticate that, but having known Julia and most everyone who did know her says if it didn't happen, it could have. So we we follow her career. Um, from in 1966, when I became a reporter and started covering politics in Aberdeen, uh, I got to know Julia really well. Um, and there were times when she would call me uh, at 1 a.m. and comment on a story, and it was really pretty remarkable. Consider this. Julia Butler Hansen became, um, in 1949, the first woman ever to head the Washington State House, uh, House of Representatives Highways Committee, which was a real big deal. Front page news in the Seattle Times. She proceeded, and the reason she got that job is because during World War II, she had been the secretary at the engineering department at, in Wakayakum County. And when the engineer was called up for service during World War II, she took over as acting engineer with no, her, by the way, her degree and from the University of Washington was in home economics. And within a year, the guys on the road crew uh, figured that she could not only run a road grader, but that she knew more about the highways and, and byways and how to lay down a, a, a greater road than, than her old boss who was off someplace in California in war work. So 1949, she gets the job. In 1951, she becomes the first female member of the 11 Western States Interstate Highway Commission. In 1956, when President Eisenhower's initiative to build interstate highways really caught fire and states, uh, the Congress appropriated money for, um, for state projects, Julia became one of the most authoritative highway spokesman uh, experts in America um, is on, authenticated by no less than stories in the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times. 
By the way, in 1955, she came within one vote of becoming the first female speaker of the Washington State House of Representatives. It take, would take until 2020 for a woman, Lori Jenkins, to become Speaker of the House. But uh, Julia, um, three men in particular, uh, engineered Julia's de demise for that in that race by cutting some backroom deals. But they were still terrified of her. So, so afterwards, um, sheepishly came up to her on the floor of the house and said, Julia, no hard feelings, okay? And she said, okay, but I'll get even with you sons of bitches. And that was vintage Julia, and she did. Boy, believe me, did she. Uh, one in particular never forgot, because for the next two years, everything that he tried to pass in the House of Representatives got derailed by her committee. Along the way, by the way, she did something really daring. In 1957, a young engineer from Seattle named Dan Evans uh, was got himself elected to the legislature. He was a civil engineer. Uh, Julia was impressed. He was a Republican. But before long, she decided that she needed him on her interim committee on highways because, after all, he was an engineer and she didn't care about the Republican part. Well, members of the Republican Party, even in the hierarchy, said, hey, that's a really bad idea. They're senior guys. Uh, who deserved that shot. And besides, the, then the Democrats' uh, leadership said, what in the world are you doing? He looked at him. He's, he's an Eagle Scout. He's bushy-tailed. He's going places. And Julia said, forget that. Highways are bipartisan. We need him. Um, Dan Evans never forgot that. And when Julia retired from Congress, he named her to the Washington State Highways Commission, where she served with distinction. So, it's a fascinating story all around. But in 1967, only six, seven years after Julia uh, was elected to Congress, something extraordinary happened by her sheer moxie and um, the fact that she could be a, a, a woman's man and a man's woman and had all of that, that savvy. She got herself chosen to head to be the first ever woman to head a congressional appropriations subcommittee. And the subcommittee she got was interior and related agencies, which put her in the absolute catbird seat with Henry M. Jackson, who was the Senate subcommittee appropriations committee, a Senate interior subcommittee chairman to be uh, have purview over the U.S. Forest Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Fish and Wildlife Service, all the stuff that really mattered. So I write in this biography of Julia that's coming out on November 1, that in that era, it was, there were three household names in Washington politics. It was Warren Magnuson, Maggie, Henry M. Jackson, Scoop, and Julia. So the, getting to do that book was such a treat because, um, Although Julia died in 1988, I sometimes uh, imagine her still calling me in the middle of the night to give me hell about some editorial that we hadn't written or ought to write or, or had written. And um, when she was mad, she always called me Johnny. And the only other person who called me Johnny was my mother. So I knew that I was in trouble. But there's an overview of ahead of the curve and these amazing women in Washington state who really have been ahead of the curve. And I'd be glad to field any questions um, and to talk to uh, about uh, how important I think it is for you to be oral historians in your own right. I can give you about three quick tips on how to do that. People all, there's books that have been written about doing oral history. I would, as pro forma, we buy them and we read them. They're, they're almost always awful. They, they never tell you any of the really important practical things you need to do about doing oral history. So I can save you some money there with all due respect to other authors. Um, you don't need to do a book, buy a book about doing oral history to do oral history. Hi, Vicki. I'm going to mute myself. Did you give the three tips? Well, I'll give the three tips. Yeah. There's three tips on how to do oral history. Yeah. The first one is to do it. My uncle Marvin used to say, we're burning daylight 
and we really are. When I think of the stories that we've captured in the past 12 years, John Spellman, Slade Gordon, I mean, the, the people we've lost, Lillian Walker, the civil rights person, I mean, it's Booth Gardner, and I talked to Booth Gardner when he was on the rebound from his battle with Parkinson's disease and had deep brain surgery, and he was all his own self, his old um, gregarious self for the six months that I talked to him, and then he fractured his ankle, and the next time I could talk to him, the lights were on, but nobody was home. It was heartbreaking. So three tips, do it make a resolution to do it if you've got an uncle bill or an aunt madge or your your dad who was in the korean war and the vietnam war has all those stories that has all that genealogy that would be so precious to share record it so all you need to do is do your homework if dad was in vietnam do a little go to the mercer island library and check out some books about the tet offensive or whatever dad was in and be knowledgeable enough to ask some some key questions and the questions you ought to ask are what we call open-ended so instead of saying to someone when the japanese attacked on december 7 1941 were you afraid and the answer to that would inevitably be yes instead of saying that ask uncle bill you were 10 years old in 1941 when the japanese attacked pearl harbor tell me all about what happened in mercer island the next day and how you felt and what what the teacher said when you went to school and were there blackout lights tell me all about it just get him talking then the the other rule um is shut up and listen Ask the open-ended questions and don't try to dominate the narrative yourself. It's okay to jump in and, and, and remind someone to, to sort of prod their memory, but be a good listener. And then I guess rule number four, maybe it's five, I always, uh, I always say bring extra batteries because there's nothing worse than being in the middle of a really great interview with your Aunt Madge and finding, looking down and seeing that little a meter on your your Sony tape recorder go vroom, and be out of batteries. Then you got to stop and find batteries. Hope you got batteries and it interrupts everything. So those are the things to do. How to do oral history? Um, do your homework. Ask open-ended questions. Shut up and listen. Bring extra batteries. That's all you need to know. Well said. <laughs> Practical. <laughs> um. One question I had was, how does Legacy Washington choose their topics for who you're going to write a book about? Great question. The, um, we get, apart from that mandate that, we, that I talked about earlier, where we're looking for former statewide elected officials, former is the key there, um, former members of the judiciary, former members of Congress, and these uh, again this this wonderful um extra added attraction people from all walks of life who've made an indelible uh, contribution to the political history of washington state so there's people out people call and tell us all the time give us tips about people that, that fit in that category and um former appellate court judge robin hunt was the one who called me and said, I just went to a Martin Luther, Luther King Day program in Kitsap County, and I heard the most incredible woman. She's 95 years old, and she was in the trenches for civil rights and the NAACP in Bremerton, and nobody's ever heard of her. You ought to do a story. So a week later, I was in Lillian Walker's front room with my tape recorder, and the rest is history. It's a really good book. It People ought to know about it. Gallingly, when we were getting to roll out the book, we called the NAACP people in uh, Seattle and said, hey, you need to be there standing tall because we're going to honor Mrs. Walker. And the otherwise uh, well-meaning young man I talked to said these immortal words, we're still trying to figure out who she is. And I said, well, with all due respect, I'll tell you who she is. Come to this, come to the book launch and meet uh, 
Washington's Rosa Parks. She's the real deal. So we, we love tips from people all over this great state. We re we're really trying to be, to broaden into Eastern Washington in particular. Um, that's been somewhat challenging because we're here and they're there, but boy, the more the merrier. Uh, we will respectfully listen to every suggestion. Um, someone called the other day, people sometimes are aggrieved by people they see who aren't included. And honestly, um, the best we can do absent a tip is not be so encyclopedic in our knowledge that we, we actually do know that uh, somebody who lives in Mercer Island or Hunts Points or whatever had a remarkable um, hero, story of heroism in Korea, Vietnam, or Gulf War, and we don't have eyes in the back of our heads, and we're not all knowing. So we need we need library patients, patrons. We need library patients who, in my experience, are the best read, most informed people in their communities to share these tips with us. Excellent. So you've got your wonderful book coming out in November. Do you have anything on the slate that you're working on currently? Yes, we do. We're gonna, Lori Mott, Amber Rainey, Bob Young, and our new teammate, Aaron Poplowski, who used to be with the sadly now defunct Computer Museum in Seattle, are working on a project that spotlights the, the artifacts and treasures in the Washington State Library where we're privileged to work. Uh, and, the Washington State Library is a movable feast, friends. Uh, former Secretary of State Sam Reeves saved it from extinction in a round of budget cuts in the Locke administration and said, don't you can't close the library, give it to me, I'll make it work. Uh, Secretary Wyman has redoubled her efforts uh, to, to make certain uh, and through thick and thin that the library's collection is maintained and to, to keep it vibrant. The, so, the State Library has a, a vast collection of microfilm from virtually every newspaper in the state since territorial days. Uh, card catalog files. I'm thrown back to my days as a page at the Aberdeen Library in 1959 with a card catalog file that if you didn't keep up right, then the library and Rosalie Spellman was going to be very upset with you. But so we've got a trove of historic books from Isaac Stevens' days as territorial governor that a core collection at the library, maps, ships manifest, archaeological and genealogical troves of that. And in the state library are amazing partners under state uh, archivist Steve Excel and his crew. We've got remarkable documents. By the way, the, one of the things that we're, we're very proud of at the Secretary of State's office is that we have the envy of the world in the Washington State Digital Archives. You can go online to the Secretary of State's website, drill into the, the digital archives, and find just amazing stuff that will they'll fuel your genealogical searches, every, the land transfer records, marriages, births. Uh, cemetery records, prison records, it's all there. Uh, and then with uh, Legacy Washington, so we, we, we have, we'll combine in this exhibit um, everything from the Washington State Archives collection of really colorful and collectible fruit, cr fruit crate labels. And they're really neat. Some of them are, are they're, they're collectible now. In the days when uh, fruit, uh, Washington fruit was being exported across the continent by rail, the, the Washington growers needed uh, distinctive ways to market their wares. So they'd have four color, beautifully lithographed labels of Mount Rainier and uh, delicious apples and it's great stuff. And uh, there's also at the, at the State Library, speaking of suffrage, we have, we have digitized the scrapbooks of Emma Smith DeVoe and Josephine Corliss Preston to, to name two. I couldn't have written the Josephine Corliss Preston book within a book and ahead of the curve without those digitized scrapbooks. And Josephine, bless her heart, had saved all this ephemera, all of her clippings and buttons and badges. And it was, 
It's just a movable feast and all that's accessible. It's all online. It's a movable feast. Awesome. I have a, a question from chat. What is your opinion about the closing of the National Archives in Seattle and moving the items elsewhere? A disaster. A disaster for researchers. Um, a, 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 I'm speaking now as a historian, and this should not be imbued with any kind of political leanings, because above all, what we're about in this office of the Secretary of State uh, as historians and with the, the absolutely, in my view, sacred duty to protect free and fair elections in a nonpartisan way. So uh, when I say that it's a disaster, I'm speaking as a historian and archivist. Um, in the Native American tribes um, see those records as, as crucial to their self-determination and their sense of, of history as well. It's a really um, ill-advised um, decision. And I, I hope that, that we can, I, I, I'm not up to date on where we stand in trying to interdict that decision, but it's, it's, it's foolhardy in my way. A disservice to history. Thanks, John. Um, I would invite anybody, that's all we have in chat right now, if anybody has trouble typing questions into chat or would just prefer to ask verbally, I, I'd invite you to unmute yourself now if you'd like to ask John a question yourself. John, do you know where all that stuff's being taken to from Sandpoint what? Way? I don't know where it's being taken to, Nancy, but I, I assume it's going to be just um, disseminated to other repositories uh, in in other uh, in other places. Making it uh, these are just these documents are just treasures. The you know it's said of the Smithsonian that it's America's uh, attic. And that uh, to the extent that we don't value um, our history and that we can't imbue young people, uh, first, first, our role as librarians and parents, uh, grandparents, is to give children the magic carpet that a library, that a public library is. The hap my mom um, was a single mom who had a hard time making her way up the ranks from uh, being a clerk to a manager in the telephone company. Uh, my sister and I spent so many amazing afternoons in the children's room at the Aberdeen and Hoquim Public Libraries. And that was just, um, it was reading is just a gift. I have a brand new grandson, he's seven months old, but we're already reading to him as we all should be reading to infants, whether it's the, the sheep and the Jeep or whatever. And I, his eyes just light up. The, um, so when, when we were at the Secretary of State's office, Lori, Amber, Bob, Aaron, and I, the people at the archives and those amazing front line reference librarians at the state library, we interact with people every day. Not, sadly, not so much now, uh, though the state library is open uh, to researchers, but those people we meet are, they're doing important work. They're doing work, some of the books that they're working on seemingly um, are obscure. Um, but not to not to the, the the broader sense, family histories and and documentation of where a railroad ran in Mason County. Those those are the can be picked up as the grist for uh, scholars doing broader work on railroad history, on on suffrage history. In this this field of suffrage history, I found. I found, sadly, how little I knew about the battle in the trenches between um, 1854 and the roller coaster ride that Washington women were on to finally secure their rights. In the business of the way socialist women, Republican women, Democrat women, unaffiliated women in women's clubs fought back against chauvinism. Um, Pretty remarkable. Roland Hartley, that gar that troglodyte governor I mentioned, who 
who didn't believe that, that, that the public schools deserved any funding also tried to well, he purge the, the University of Washington Board of Regents of uh, people uh, who, who opposed him. And one of those that he uh, purged was the first ever woman regent. Um, and she had been a suffragist, an author, um, it's, it's a rich history. I have to tell you, by the way, about a remarkable book you all should read. It's written by our friend and colleague, Shanna Stevenson. It's called Women's Votes, Women Voices, Women's Voices. It um, was first written for the centennial uh, 10 years ago of the Washington women getting the vote ahead of the 19th Amendment, um, published by the Washington State Historical Society, which I'm so proud to, uh, of which to be a trustee, uh, being reissued. It's uh, not only is it a beautiful book, filled with uh, four color images of ephemera and clippings. Uh, Shanna is a masterful scholar, and it was she who documented in this book that the movement here to, uh, in 1910, absolutely reinvigorated the national mo movement, which had been um, sort of dormant until uh, Washington jump-started things. And it, uh, she's just a remarkable historian, and you should read her book. I recommend it to you. Thank you. I just posted that link into our KCLS catalog for both that one and the one you mentioned earlier, um, Stephanie's book, The Way We Never Were, posted those links. Uh, we have those in our KCLS catalog. Well, hey. yeah. Um, th this is Jane Brom, and I just wanted to let you know that um, I read some months ago that the plans were to move our National Archives to Kansas City, Missouri. That's um, where I'm from, but it's also the National Archives for about seven Midwestern states. So it's an effort to consolidate. I think it's terrible that our records would be so far away. Anyway. Yes. But Kansas City is where they're headed, I'm told. Well, thank you for that. And I just saw someone pipe in with someone who absolutely deserves a biography her own, of her own, and that is Maud Kimball Butler, Julia Butler Hansen's amazing mother. Maud Kimball Butler, like her friend Josephine Corliss Preston, was elected a county school superintendent at a time when she could not vote for herself, when women couldn't vote. And Maud Kimball Butler uh, became Wakaikum County School Superintendent, a deputy superintendent of public instruction under Josephine Corliss Preston, um, and and one of the a, a historian in her own right, an inspirational teacher, and one of the best watercolorists in Washington State history. I mean, her the Washington State Historical Society did a whole uh, monologue of a collection of Maud Kimber, Kimball Butler's um, watercolors. In 1962, um, Maud Kimball Butler, um, because of Julia's extraordinary achievement of being the second ever woman elected to Congress from Washington State, was named Washington's Mother of the Year. And Maud was very self-effacing. Uh, her daughter, Julia, was a member of the United States Congress. Her son, James, was the director of the film school the, uh, our, the, at, the, uh, at USC. And uh, Maud said it was just that what you needed to do was to expose children to learning and encourage them to be themselves. And she was just, how I wish I could have known her. And like, like Maud, Maud's mother was, uh, a suffragist who really railed in the 1890s as a pioneer woman that men, she said that, that, uh, that the men could get sinking drunk and go off to the polls and cast their votes and, and, and make deals and sell their votes. And here she was, uh, a learned woman, um, reduced to being the, on the sidelines because of, of pure chauvinism. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really remarkable family story. All right, yeah, thank you for that comment. 
All right, folks, I think that this about wraps up our program. I want to thank John and Lori from Legacy Washington. John, wonderful presentation and um, yeah, my honor. That's incredible. I encourage people to check that out either through the library or through the direct link to Legacy Washington's bookstore. I want to thank um, the friends of the Mercer Island Library for sponsoring this program and of course my beloved Mercer Island Historical Society for um, giving us the inspiration to reach out to, to Legacy Washington and John and bring them here tonight. So thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Keep reading. Bye.